The need to call attention to hate and racism in Canada is reinforced by the news uh, this weekend of attacks against two mosques, one in St. John's, Newfoundland, and one in Mississauga, Ontario, and the release last week of a Statistics Canada report which said that police reported hate crimes increased by 37% in 2020 to their highest rate ever. And we need to be aware of the fact that the vast majority of hate crimes are not reported to police, so that number is in fact far higher. In addition, there's the ongoing $2.5 billion, $2 billion class action lawsuit filed on behalf of current and former black employees of the federal government about the unjust practice of black employee exclusion due to systemic discrimination and racism within the ranks of the federal civil service. Now, before introducing our speakers today, there's just a few items I would like to cover about today's uh, virtual media conference. Following my opening statement, I ask that each speaker speak in the order that you are introduced. The moderator of the room, Chrissy Benz, will pin each speaker's screen when it's your turn to speak. Please begin your remarks when your image is highlighted. There will be an opportunity for journalists in the room to ask questions after everyone has spoken. If you have a question, please post a request in the questions chat box. You'll be identified by Chrissy and your mic will be turned on. Before asking your question, please identify yourself and the news organization you are with and to whom you are directing your question. After that person has responded, other speakers was also, will also have the opportunity to comment if they choose to do so. Um, there may be others in the room who are observers, who are not journalists. These are people affiliated with the organizations that are participating. Please do not type anything into the chat or question boxes as it could be distracting to speakers. I'd now like to introduce the speakers for today. To begin with, regrettably, Professor Sabrina Gafar Siddiqui had a work emergency that was unavoidable and she emailed me early this morning to say that she will unfortunately not be able to participate. Um, also, we are still waiting on one of our speakers and hopefully um, there's nothing happened uh, with him because uh, we have not received any email. So I'll begin by introducing, first of all, Alex Yahama, who is the Executive Director of the Canadian Congress on Diversity. Noor Watad, who is the Director of Media, Campus and Community, De Community Development with Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Samir Majoub, who has yet to join us, who is the President of the Canada Muslim Forum and Rabbi David Mavasir, member of the organization Independent Jewish Voices and a human rights and anti-racism activist. Je commencerai mes remarques en soulignant que nous vivons dans une nation fondée sur la génocide autochtone, l'esclavage, la suprématie blanche et le racisme systémique. C'est quelque chose qui doit être reconnu par les dirigeants politiques et par les Canadiens si nous voulons démanteler l'infrastructure raciste qui sous-tend les principales institutions publiques et privées de ce pays. Et à cause de cette histoire, il n'est pas étonnant, étonnant que le racisme soit ancré dans l'ADN de cette nation et c'est pourquoi il doit y avoir un effort beaucoup plus important et plus concerté pour lutter contre la haine, le racisme, la xénophobie et la suprématie blanche I'd like to begin my remarks by noting that we live in a nation built on indigenous genocide, slavery, white supremacy, and systemic racism. It's something that needs to be acknowledged by political leaders and by Canadians if we are to dismantle the racist infrastructure that underpins the major public and private institutions of this country. And because of that history, it's no wonder that racism is baked into the DNA of this nation. And it's why there needs to be a much greater and more concerted effort to fight hate, racism, xenophobia, and white supremacy in all its forms. <clears throat> Over the last few years, there have been efforts by the federal government to address hate and racism, but those efforts have been inadequate to the task at hand. In addition, rather than being proactive, these efforts have been reactive in response to incidents like the anti-racism protests arising out of the murder of George Floyd, 
the discovery of the remains of indigenous children in unmarked, in unmarked graves at former residential school sites, and the murder of a Muslim family by a white supremacist in London, Ontario last June. Furthermore, there's the issue of racism within government and within the political class. Frankly, racialized and minority communities are sick and tired of seeing racism and prejudice at the political level, despite numerous statements by political leaders that racism has no place in Canada. De plus, il y a la question de racisme au sein du gouvernement, au sein de la classe politique. Franchement, les communautés racialisées et minoritaires ont, ont assez de voir le racisme et les préjugés au niveau politique, malgré les nombreuses déclarations des dirigeants politiques selon lesquels le racisme n'a pas de sa place au Canada. Such political platitudes are useless without decisive actions to fight racism without leadership at the national level, to implement a Canada-wide anti-hate strategy, and without actions to eliminate any hint of racism from within public and government institutions. The latest example of racism at the national level was played out during the trucker protests and occupation of Ottawa in February. It's a prime example of the apathy of government to deal with racists and white supremacists. The promoters and organizers of the protest had a history of publicly promoting racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and its incitements to racial violence. They called for insurrection in their online manifesto, and white protesters paraded around with Nazi symbols, Confederate flags, and hateful messaging. Yet political leaders and police allowed them to take a city hostage. In addition, they were supported, encouraged, and enabled by current Conservative leader Candace Bergen, MP Pierre Polyev, and other Conservative MPs who were only too happy to give political legitimacy to these promoters of hate. Had the protest been organized by Indigenous or Black people, I can safely say that the full force of the law would have come down on them very quickly. These actions were the latest in a series of incidents where political leaders tolerated and enabled hate. Another example is Quebec's Bill 21 secularism law, a blatantly racist law that has targeted racialized religious minorities by violating the charter rights of Muslims, Jews, and Sikhs for the past three years. Federalist party leaders have done nothing to challenge it, with conservative leaders saying they would not intervene to oppose the law, and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh saying if he were prime minister, he would only intervene if it got to the Supreme Court. Racism is also evident in Canada's response to Russia's war on, war on Ukraine, and the government's actions to deal with the flood of Ukrainian refugees when compared to how the government responded to Canada's Afghan allies who were fleeing the Taliban takeover of that country or other international conflicts where the victims are not white or Christian. Le racisme est également évident dans la réponse du Canada à la guerre de la Russie contre l'Ukraine et les mesures prises par le gouvernement pour faire face à la flux de réfugiés ukrainiens par rapport à la façon dont le gouvernement a répondu aux alliés afghans du Canada qui fuaient la prise de pouvoir des Taliban sur ce pays ou d'autres conflits internationaux où les victimes ne sont, ne sont ni blanches ni chrétiens. If political leaders want to live up to their claims that they oppose racism and want to fight hate, they need to do far better than what they've done to date. So once again, as we have done for the past several years, Canadians United Against Hate is calling on the federal government to lead and manage an aggressive and publicly visible national strategy to counter hate, racism, and white supremacy across Canada, including in political discourse, in print and broadcast media, and particularly on social media platforms and the internet, and that sufficient funding be provided on an annual basis for this initiative, and that it be coordinated with provincial governments. As part of this, all Canadian government policies need to be examined through an anti-racist uh, lens, the same way that the government has adopted a proactive feminist approach to government policy and uh, looking at government policies through a feminist lens. We are also recommending that the federal government put in place legislation to tackle hate on all social media, web hosting and web, ser web service providers operating in Canada, regardless of whether their headquartered headquarters are located outside Canada and that financial penalties be levied on companies which allow their platforms to be used to promote hate commensurate with th that company's revenues. We also believe that the government should lead by example to undo systemic racism in society. Therefore, we are again recommending that the federal government implement a policy 
to diversify the top tiers of federal agencies, boards and commissions and crown corporations by ensuring that the boards of, boards of directors of these government institutions and senior management reflect the ethno-racial diversity of Canada and that this be mandated through federal legislation or regulations. These are just three of the 17 recommendations contained in a submission that was sent to the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion last summer, which I believe is not being taken seriously by the government. I say this because beyond an acknowledgement, noting that they received our submission, there has been no further communication with government on this file. The truth is that the Canadian government needs to take a more aggressive approach to fighting hate and racism in Canada than it has to date. Because if not now, when? And if not, then why not? Canadians are watching, and we will hold political leaders to account for their failures on these critical issues that are affecting millions of lives in Canada and overseas. That concludes my remarks, and I will now um, ask uh, Alex to uh, speak. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Farid Khan, uh, certainly for this uh, uh, media platform and for your passionate opening. I have a very few minutes to express mine. So I'll just say, um, to commemorate the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, I want to pay homage first and foremost to the thousands of indigenous children who were murdered in the residential school system. Pay homage to the thousands of indigenous people who are still fighting to have drinking water here in Canada. Pay homage to the Muslims who are being knocked off every day just for taking a walk in the park. Pay homage to the increasing number of black people that are languishing in jail. 80%, I read recently, increase of black people in jail. We're not, we're not increasing that much rate in the population of Canada. I want to pay homage to the racialized people who COVID knocked off, not because, simply because of the inequities in the healthcare system. There were people who could have been saved. I want to pay homage to other minoritized people, those who are marginalized, minoritized, hypnotized, racialized. I want to pay homage to everybody certainly in Canada and around the world, who are still under the oppressive colonial structure. Colonialism continues to prevail. When white supremacists, when they stormed the Congress in the US, we all watched that. Many Canadians were disgusted, including me, about it. Some went as far as saying this will never happen in Canada. But it did. It did. We all saw it on TV. When the people who belong to the predominant narrative, mostly those who are part of the white or Caucasian culture, they stormed the, the parliament. They held the city of Ottawa hostage. People watched it in Africa. They called me. People watched it in Asia. And they say, America is not different. Canada is not different from America. Before we point the finger across the border, let us put ourselves in check on this very day of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. I recall the Prime Minister saying on TV, I saw it, I was furious. I was there with my wife. I saw the Prime Minister saying, we will not use military against Canadians. So we are going to continue negotiating with these people who have held us hostage in Ottawa. I was disgusted because just a few weeks and a few months ago, they used military against the indigenous people in British Columbia. They continue to use the military against the indigenous people of this country, and yet you say you will not use it against Canadians. Disgusting to see. Yet we see all these all this inequities and, and th things going on. Um, I certainly uh, appreciate if the United Nations consider it worthy to declare today, and some people may not know the origin, is because of the killing that happened in South Africa. Peaceful protesters were, were, were sh shot to death in South Africa during the apartheid. We also see the force that is being used when the Black Lives Matter movement, when they are advancing their cause. They are not asking for free money. They are not asking for free anything. They are asking simply to be recognized as humans, simply to be recognized as citizens. So we can't stay here and point the finger across the border when we have things to do and things to take care of in our own neighborhood. 
we are the Canadian Congress, we are committed and we are standing by Canadians uh, united against hate and other organizations around this country to fight for, for the end of systemic racism if you, we can end it, if we can end it and we can actually make significant strides in our lifetime. For far too long, for far too long, the inequities in humanities have revealed themselves through tragedies. Let's take the war in Ukraine, for instance. The war instigated by Russia is despicable without a question. And the treatment of Ukrainians refugee continues to reveal the depth of racism and discrimination that racialized people continue to face. While we encourage nations to welcome Ukrainian refugees, for, for the record, we encourage them to welcome Ukrainian Recording in progress. Proclamation. President Lincoln sent a long message to the Congress, which was largely routine. But in this, he proposed controversial measures, uh, such as the voluntary colonization of slaves and compensated emancipation. In that speech on December 1st, 1862, Lincoln called on the Congress and said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The dogmas, he said, of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion, Lincoln said, is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion, as we are doing here today. As our case is new, Lincoln continued, so we must think anew, and we must act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then and then only we shall save our country, said Lincoln. Fellow citizens, he continued, we cannot escape history. And I tell this to every Canadian, white, black, green, gay, straight, it doesn't matter who you are, what gender, who you love, who you serve. Fellow Canadians, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress, use leveraging Abraham Lincoln's words here, and this administration will be remembered. Every Canadian will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. In the words of Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. So I applaud the Canadians united against hate I applaud uh, the CTV news and all these news, uh, media news here to, to, to begin to look at even life events and news events from the eyes of equity and diversity, because that's what we stand for. Equity and diversity is not going anywhere. It's part of humanity and part of creation. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Alex, and it's uh, very difficult for anybody to follow that act, uh, but uh, it is now left to uh, Noor Watad to uh, make her remarks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Noor Watad, and I'm the Director of Media Campus and Community Development for Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that I currently reside on the traditional territory of the Atawadaran Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, and Lunapiwak, people of Southwestern Ontario. CJPM will make the following statement. When the United Nations first established this day against racism, they decided to mark it on the anniversary of the Sharpeville massacre of 1960, when South African police killed 69 people during a peaceful demonstration against apartheid laws. Although South Africa's system of apartheid has long since ended, groups including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have recently concluded that Israel also practices apartheid against the Palestinians. The parallels of injustice are clear, but sadly the government of Canada has responded to each situation in radically different ways. 
While many Canadians are proud of the role that Canada took to oppose Israel, apartheid in South Africa, Canada today refuses to take any action against apartheid in Israel and is completely unwilling to even engage with the, human, with the work of human rights organizations on the ground. Instead, Canada has grown closer to its bilateral ties with the Israeli regime and has condemned activists who speak out against Israel's racist policies. This is not something that we can be proud of, but it reveals a profound double standard in Canada's foreign policy. As a Palestinian Canadian born in Jerusalem, Palestine, with strong ties to Palestine, I cannot even count the ways in which Canada falls short in protecting me from the anti-Palestinian racism here and fails to uphold the rights of Palestinians in Palestine, Israel. This moment also provides an opportunity to reflect on Canada's refugee policies and the way that we tend to respond differently to different populations. We have seen Canada offer to accept with open arms unlimited Ukrainian refugees who are, fleeing, who are fleeing Russian aggression. In this way, we show tremendous empathy and compassion. This is completely necessary and commendable, but the question must be asked, why have we been unable to extend the same support for refugees outside of Europe, including Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, or Palestine? Surely we have capacity to welcome any asylum seekers fleeing conflict and strife, regardless of where they come from. Underlining this problem is the fact that Canada's refugees, refugee assistance measures are priorita prioritizing Ukrainian na nationals, while excluding foreign workers, students, or undocumented people from other countries who are living in Ukraine. There should be no distinction in our assistance to refugees, all of whom are fleeing the same war. We know well that these struggles against racism and discrimination are not happening in isolation, but that our movements must be intersectional and connected. CJPME expresses its solidarity with all movements for racial justice, including Black Lives Matter, Indigenous land defenders, and migrant workers. On this, on this, the International Day for Elimination of Racial Discrimination, all Canadians must pledge to do better for victims of racial discrimination and apartheid. Thank you. Thank you very much for those passionate remarks, Nuru. Um, I will now call on Rabbi David Nevasier to uh, deliver his remarks. David, you're muted. So thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm speaking with you from a territory that was covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt agreement, which acknowledges that we're all living really in the same space and we all need to take care of it as well as take care of each other. I'd like to start with a story from my tradition that I love. I'm speaking here as a rabbi. Um, you know, in the Bible, it says that God created one couple in the beginning, just one couple. And our ancient rabbis asked the question, if God could create anything, why did God start humanity with just one couple? Why not create the world with millions of people? And the answer that they gave is obviously a rhetorical question, but the answer that they gave for teaching purposes was they said that God created the world with just one couple so that no one after that could ever say.
scarf and is told they must either remove it or get out of class. But at the same time, students can come to class wearing T-shirts from the, uh, the Israeli military and they're perfectly welcome in class. When this goes on, that's a manifestation of hatred, an attempt to suppress and actually erase people's identity and people's own lived experience. And it's being done in Canada under the guise, deceptively, of protecting Jewish people in Canada from some kind of anti-Jewish hatred. So I wanna bring that to people's attention there's, I think, a very deceptive attempt to have this adopted by different levels of government, from um, our federal government to provincial governments, municipal governments, and other institutions that actually have quite a lot of power over people's lives, universities, library systems, and so on. Um, and I think everything else I might have said here today has already been said quite well by one of the speakers that came before me. So I just want to thank uh, media for coming and giving your attention to this issue, which is not over. It's an ongoing issue. And I, I want to thank uh, Farid for organizing this for us today. Thank you very much, David. Um, Chrissy, I don't notice uh, Samir in the room. Okay, that's uh, that's unfortunate. I haven't received an email for him. Um, given, given that, um, I think, uh, Chrissy, I will let you now open the room to questions from the media. Thank you. I'll bring our speakers back to the front. And media, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, if you can raise your hand and I will call on you to ask a mute and ask your question. And if you can identify yourself and your outlet, as well as if the question is for all four of the speakers or if there's a particular person. So I'll look for raised hands. If you're unable to raise your hand, uh, you can come on. Okay, perfect. And I'll just ask you to unmute and you can introduce yourself. Hi, this is Shaoli Lee from City News. Uh, this is a question for Fareed Khan, though certainly anyone could answer it if they feel comfortable doing so. I was just, I, I understand in your remarks, you said you hadn't heard back from the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion on the submission made previously, other than just this sort of acknowledgement that it had been received. When was the last time anyone from that ministry or the ministry's office or the anti-racism secretariat or any of the many federal government groups or figures ostensibly responsible for addressing these problems. When was the last time you had contact with any of these groups or, or they addressed any of these concerns? Well, with the uh, department itself, the submission was made to the previous uh, diversity minister, Bardis Chugger. Um, of course, we raised some of these issues during the election campaign last uh, August and September. We were very disappointed that uh, racism did not uh, uh, play a, a bigger role in some of the issues discussed during the election. And I have had a couple of meetings or encountered MPs um, since then, but um, official uh, communication with the government on those recommendations, it's been zero since uh, that acknowledgement last summer. And I have had no communication with the office of the uh, of the uh, current uh, minister, Ahmed Hussein. Just as a follow up, if the problem seems to exist persistently at a political level, both institutionally and from individuals, as you mentioned, where do you see solutions coming from? Or to put it another way, if existing political levers and mechanisms are unable to address this, who and how should this be addressed? Well, unfortunately, there are not many levers uh, at this point beyond the political that uh, where action can be taken. There needs to be a political commitment made. Um, I start off by my comments by saying that we need to acknowledge that we live on land that was conquered uh, and we, we live in a nation built on um, indigenous genocide, slavery and white supremacy. That's a reality. And those, that history is baked into the DNA of all our institutions, our, our major institutions, public and private. We need official acknowledgement by government, by politicians that this, that's the case. That is the starting point. 
And while we've had um, announcements and policies proposed, until we can admit that to ourselves as a nation, as Canadians, um, I think, you know, what we're doing is piecemeal. And, um, you know, to try and get things accomplished, uh, it, we, organizations like ours and, and Alex's, CJPME, uh, voices like David's, um, we need to continue to speak out and put pressure on the government. Um, we need to make sure that they are listening because I get the feeling that there are oftentimes they are not listening despite what they're saying or when they do respond, it's paying lip service to the issue. And I welcome anybody else on the, uh, of the speakers to please weigh in on this. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll jump in on that. Um, the government, as we know, uh, they are the cause of the problem. Remember, there were times that uh, most of what we are fighting against today were once laws in this country. It was law for indigenous people to even hire a lawyer way back. It was law that indigenous people were savage until that was taken off, I believe, in, in the 70s. It was law that blacks were banned from Canada. These are laws that were made by government. So we must recognize that we're asking, in fact, let me quote Albert Einstein. He says, you cannot solve the same problem with the mind that created the problem in the first place. So with that said, I will tap on what my friend Farid said and said, we must take that responsibility into our hands. You is asking the question, fine media person, what are you doing? Martin Luther King said, we must all ask ourselves, what are we doing? If we're going to stay here and tell the colonial behemoth of the Canadian government to begin to change laws that they put in place in the first place intentionally, Right now, we are trying to remove Ryerson from Ryerson University. We have many of them on the currency we spend. Many of the faces on the Canadian dollars we spend were slave owners and racist, and they, they claim to be racist. They make comments that are in history. So when we stay here and say we are pointing, we are here to get the media, the government's attention, but we are here to get our own attention. We are here to get the attention of you asking the question. We are here to get the attention of the student, of the nurse, of the teacher, of the doctor. Right. The rabbi talked about a student banned from school. What did the other teachers do? What did the other teachers do to see a student who has been expelled because he, he, he made a comment, which was not even a hate comment, but a comment of solidarity? Where do we stand when we stand and let all these injustices go? We are equally guilty, equally guilty. If there's anybody listening to this right now, anybody listening to this 100 years from now, and you are not doing anything, nothing whatsoever, other than to be an onlooker, you are part of the problem. The government will eventually shift, that's true, but they are known to shift after thousands of years, thousands of years. So the question it should be less of what the government is doing, as Martin Luther King said, or even JFK said it. It's not what your country can do for you, it's what you can do for your country. So we thank Farid and his organization for putting this up. We are the Canadian Congress. We put up events all throughout the year. We did indigenous events, women event. We are educating people, making every effort to increase education and awareness. Keeping in mind that the books used in school are abbreviated. They are racist. The books don't talk. Black history did not begin with slavery. Blacks flourished way before the Europeans visited Africa. It's documented. The pyramids in Egypt, right? We, 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 just yesterday, I, I, I knew of a book called the, the Black Dollar, talking about Black Wall Street in the US. So, but today when you talk of Blacks, they talk of slavery. That's untrue. We flourished way, 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 way. My grandfather, frankly, I have documented history, was a timber uh, merchant exporting timber to UK before the Queen ever visited Africa. But yet when they see me, they talk of slavery. That's untrue. So we have self-education to do. The government will come later, but let's educate ourselves first. Thank you, Alex. We have another question. Erica Abraham. Oh, Rabbi, sorry, uh, Chrissy. Um, Rabbi David, did you want to respond also on the previous question? I th think enough was said, actually. Okay. <laughs> I could add one quote, just one quote <clears throat> that Alex just uh, made me think of. That Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was born and raised and educated in Germany, and fled and found refuge in the United States, later said that living in a democracy, not all are guilty, but we are all responsible for the decisions of our governments. So I appreciate you know, what Alex just said about really all of us in every different position in society 
in our lives. You know, we may not actually be the perpetrators of racism and hatred, but we are responsible for what our society does as long as we have any position of any influence to do anything. Uh, you know, we need to each find our own place in that mix and do what we can do. So thank you. Yes, I, I, and, quickly, and quickly, I'll drop all this for the media. I'm not sure which of the TV stations, a program like Law and Order. Everybody kind of knows Law and Order. It's a show, there's a crime scene, there's investigation. I love it. But one day I watched 10 straight episodes on one of these TV channels, and it was always a black guy, either raping a white girl or a black guy stabbing a, black, a white person. And I'm like, 10 episodes in a row? showing black people killing other body or raping somebody statistically that is even untrue go and do your research on rape crimes in canada you won't see black raping white as the portrait on, on law and order so i completely stopped watching that show why am i bringing this up we are talking to the media you watch your screen share of ethnicity uh hi Yes, hello. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking questions today. My name is Erica Ibrahim with the Canadian Press. Um, when events like the convoy in Ottawa take place in which uh, predominantly white figures lead the movement, some with histories of racist organizing, what sort of government response would you applaud? And that can go to whoever would like to answer. Um, I'll, I'll begin. Uh... Well, I think that uh, we in Ottawa, we see hundreds of protests every year. The vast majority of those protests are peaceful. People come, they make their statement, they call attention to the cause that they are advocating, and then they return peacefully to their lives. Um, rarely do we see violence um, at uh, protests uh, that take place in Ottawa. However, the protest that took place and the occupation of Ottawa that took place in, uh, in February this year was founded on violent ideas. The organizers of that protest were known advocates of hate. They had incited racial violence in public statements in the past, including one of the, the uh, protesters uh, or one of the protest organizers who said that this will end in bullets. So when you have someone like that organizing a protest, and this was not something that came out of the blue, it was known beforehand. The records of the people who organized the protest were known beforehand. They were known racists, Islamophobes, anti-Semites, um, and they put, forth, uh, they, they put forth a manifesto, which was posted online, which called for the overthrow of the Canadian government, the violent overthrow of a government that had only been elected a few months earlier. If the people who had been organizing that protest had been black, if they had been indigenous, if they had been a community of color, I have no doubt that the full force of the law would have come down heavily on them. Okay. And when, when people as a form of political protest advocate violence as these people were advocating, then I think it is justifiable that there is a, um, a justice solution to the people organizing the protest. But not only were these people advocating violence and overthrow the government, they were also promoting this myth of um, white genocide, you know, which is absolutely ludicrous. The fact that because we are becoming a more racialized society, we are accepting more immigrants that uh, that is a um, existential threat to the white majority in this country. When you have those sorts of voices delivering that sort of message and calling for the overthrow of government, I think it's incumbent on the authorities to say, no, you come and make your statement as you are allowed to under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but beyond that, you get no more. And so what we saw was basically the response of the, the political leadership of this city, this province, and this country, giving in to white supremacy, giving in to racism, um, giving in to hate. And as far as I'm concerned, and I think that a lot of Canadians, that was unacceptable. Thank you. Um, and as a follow-up, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, I, uh, 
feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it was my understanding that many of the calls made today are directed toward the federal government, um, but perhaps I, I misunderstood that. But given the separation of Canadian government powers provincially with files like education and health care, um, I'm wondering what role you would want the federal government to play in those provincially led areas. Sorry, is that directed to me? Um, honest to to whomever would like to would like to take it and feels comfortable uh, responding. Thank you. Okay, um, I would appreciate. I don't want to hog the uh, the microphone, but um, um, I will say that one of the recommendations that uh, we made in that submission to the Minister of Diversity was that the federal government work with provincial governments to undertake this anti-hate strategy across the country, that it not just be um, a federal effort, but at, that it be uh, coordinated with provincial governments. One of those, uh, one of the recommendations are also included mandatory curriculum at, this, uh, at the uh, high school level that uh, teaches about racism in history in Canada, that talks about uh, uh, hate crimes and genocide so that uh, people, the students who are coming up, know what the history of racism and hate is, not only in this country, but elsewhere, and what that leads to. Um, there are roles for the provincial governments to play. Just recently, the uh, government of New Brunswick uh, provided, uh, appointed a commissioner on systemic racism. Um, I think that's a very uh, unique uh, approach to trying to deal with racism, and maybe that should be considered not just uh, in other provinces, but at the federal level as well. Yeah. Uh, anyone else, please feel free to jump in. Yes, yes. You know, um, racism is the outcome of miseducation, right? Is the outcome of ignorance. And of course, you can add greed and, and other things to it. We must understand that this is not about white or black. The concept of racism started. It was a social, economic, political construct. It was a group of white, uh, white slave owners in Virginia in the U.S. who came together and said, let's form this group against the rising forces of indigenous people and the black slaves. So at that time, Jews were not considered white because there were times you see no black, no Jews, no dogs. Italians were not considered white. Irish were not considered white. Why were they not considered white when they had the white skin color? It's because they did not have the social economic power to be considered white. Over time, the Jews have risen up. The Italians have. The Irish have. But there have been some systemic barriers which have been legislated against the rise of black people economically. So we need to go back to the drawing board. People say the system's working. You don't understand, this, the system is not working. The system is actually working the exact way it was built. Hold down people of minorities, and of course, give privileges to those who are the predominant narrative. So what am I saying? The provincial, municipal, whatever level of government, let's go back to the drawing board. You were teaching back then that blacks were apes, indigenous were savages. Now let's 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 make the, the playing field fair. Let's ensure the books that are used in schools are reflective of not just one predominant narrative or one predominant culture or ethnicity. Let it be fair. Canada, they say, is one of the most diverse multicultural countries in the world. That is on paper. In the system is not. There's only one race that is predominant, and that is the white race. As the rabbi said, this is not about picking on everybody is guilty, but everybody is responsible to leverage that is quotes. So let's begin with education, and then let's move on to start looking at policies. Why over the last three years, 80% of the black people in jail has risen, the number of black people in, in prisons have risen 80%. Why over the three last five years, we have 45 People, if the 45 percent of uh, 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 inmates in, in uh, Manitoba and some of these provinces, they are indigenous people. How can you account for a small uh, group of uh, ethnic group in the country? Like black people are like three percent in Canada, according to uh, the statistics. But yet we, 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 we constitute almost 30, 40 percent in some prisons. It is it doesn't even make sense mathematically. It doesn't make sense economically. So. Let's begin with education. I'm all for keeping black history. Yes, black history. With black, it's time to move from celebrating black history to having actionable items. Let's go back to the drawing board and reconstruct the educational system. Let's go back to the drawing board and reconstruct the judicial system. Let's go back to the drawing board and reconstruct the financial economic system in this country. Let's go back to the drawing board. So 
in 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 you know in conclusion of that the government this is gonna they don't even frankly some of times they don't even know what to do they are disoriented um it was not one of the commissioners or one of people didn't even know what was systemic racism after the death of george floyd right high level rcmp leaders they don't even know what i meant and some are saying was it quebec who's saying systemic racism doesn't exist these are people that are frankly uneducated the fact you have a university degree doesn't make you educated to leverage uh, Nelson Mandela, <laughs> education is not about what they teach you in the four words. It's literally reflective of common sense. Common sense. Eighty percent increase of black people in prison. Only three percent in Canada. That doesn't make sense. Indigenous people, forty percent in prison, and they don't represent up to five percent of the Canadian population. It doesn't make sense. So there is a role for everybody to play. But again, it begins with you and I. I would just like to add that, uh, you know, there is a relationship, obviously, despite separation of powers and constitutional authority, there are relationships between both the federal and provincial governments. And it is incumbent on the Canadian government to defend the rights of all Canadians, regardless of where they live. I briefly mentioned Quebec's Bill 21, uh, secularism law. Um, we've had politicians say, well, this is within the right of, uh, of uh, the provincial government to pass such laws. We've heard politicians say, well, a majority of people in Quebec support it. Well, just because a majority of people in the province support a law does not make it moral or justifiable. Slavery was once considered legal and a majority of people supported it. Denial, denying rights to the LGBTQ community was once considered acceptable because a majority of people supported it. Denying voting rights to women was once considered acceptable because a majority of people supported denying women the vote. This is not morally defensible. And while there are separation of laws, there are morals which cross all boundaries. And it is incumbent on the federal government to defend those rights, regardless of whether um, certain things are within federal jurisdiction or not. Um, so, you know, one of the things we're calling out today is the fact that the federal government has been woefully inadequate in its response to addressing racism and hate. And one of those manifestations of racism are things like Quebec's Bill 21. And we need federal leaders to come and call it out. In addition, we've seen manifestations of racism as uh, uh, both David and, uh, and Noor mentioned, we've seen manifestations of racism in Canada's foreign policy. You know, now we don't have, you know, we can't um, control what other governments do, but it's incumbent on a government that claims to say that it is against racism and racism has no place. It's incumbent on, those, uh, on the government and those politicians who say that to actually speak out when you have, for example, genocide taking place in China against uh, against the Uyghurs. Not only do you have to speak out, you have to take action. When you have genocide taking place still against uh, the Rohingya in uh, Myanmar, when you have an oppression that has been going on brutally by an apartheid state in Israel against Palestinians, and Canada is complicit in that apartheid. In addition, you have the Saudi government that has been undertaking a war against Yemen where 300,000 people have died. Canada is selling weapons to the aggressor. Canada is complicit in that war, and that too is racism. So regardless of whether there are jurisdictional issues, whether domestically in Canada or internationally, if you are going to uh, come out and claim to be a nation that speaks for the international legal order, that supports the international legal, legal order, then you have, to be, uh, you have to behave the same way in all situations. So all the things that are being done to help the Ukrainians, I applaud it. I think it needs to be done. These are people who are being brutalized by the Russian invasion. We have undertaken sanctions in a way that we have never undertaken against any nation. So it seems that boycott, divestment and sanctions is good when we're undertaking it against Russia, but we hear the government say, no, it's bad when we call for it against Israel. And in fact, it's anti-Semitic. So why are the tools okay, all these international tools okay to be used against this one nation in this aggression against the Ukrainians, but they're not okay to be used against others? Thank you, Fareed. Noor, did you have any comments to add based on the previous conversation? And um, while you think about that, just for any other of the media, if you want to raise your hand, I think we are coming to a close, but we're happy to take more questions. Um, I just want to say that everything that was said was amazing. I 100% agree with it. And that's what CJPME stands by. We completely devote ourselves to stand against hate 
and racism and systemat systematic oppression and white supremacy. I'll, I'll add something, uh, Erica, you asked about different levels of government, different jurisdictions. So and you mentioned federal and provincial, but I think we also need to really be vigilant about school boards, police departments, and as I said before, not only government bodies, but universities, even library systems, even parks and recreation, right? We need to look at every different level of how we function collectively, societally, and um, wherever we have influence, whether it's local or federal or wherever, you know, to do our best for all of us, for each other. I just want to include that in the, you know, if you're thinking different levels of government, we have to look at it all. Yes, and you're absolutely right. We, we have to. And one other area we must also look at is the media, right? In our research, the group that have perpetuated and promoted the concept of racism over the last 400 years, the media is on top of the list just as well as education and the judiciary, right? So the media, the power in, on this platform, no matter how small this group is, is, is very important. I talked about the shows, right? The law and order, simple shows. You watch Treehouse, right? Everybody in Treehouse, three, four straight hours, I watch Treehouse. All I see is white little puppies and little, little babies running around. Well, we got some black babies here in Canada. We got some indigenous babies here in Canada, right? My son is five. Right now, I have to let him watch some YouTube just to balance the visual, right? The media can help. I, no, no, I tell you, Noah, you got to watch a YouTube show on Black people, right? Go ahead, watch. So you see us too, right? We have Black heroes too and stuff, right? So superheroes. So the media has a critical role to play. How they even take this message today to the public is very, very important. Very, very important. So every media should go back and say, if I look at all the shows we show on TV, if it's a TV show, radio show, what is the percentage of diversity? You, you don't need the rocket science for this. You just go to Statistics Canada and say, here are the percentage of those who identify as Caucasian, here are the percentage of those, and use that to reflect your shows. If I don't know how many percent identify as Muslim, so to speak, take that percentage, apply it to your shows, apply it to your news, right? Let them be, that is what is called balanced representation. And by the way, we are open to giving you a free course on this, free course. That's what we do, free education at the Canadian Congress. We are committed to it. We are building the largest, you go to universityofdiversity.ca. We are building the largest universe, online university completely free. So we are tired of uh, education and say, oh, to change the curriculum will cost us $200 million. Okay, forget, we have built it, just use it. Let the, the people in schools know they can go to this place and get a free course. We have, we have lectures given by Honorable Jean Augustine, the Senator Don Oliver. We have uh, Senator uh, Jane McCallum, Indigenous Senator. We have courses by uh, uh, um, my Chief Mark Saunders, the only black, first black, only black uh, uh, head of uh, police. So we are asking all these people to give 25 minutes, 30 minutes uh, course on different aspects of, uh, of racism and discrimination. And we are uploading them on a system and it's growing. So the media, we are, I, I, my 10 seconds, I'm begging you, media, beg. This is not beg. This is not, uh, <laughs> this is, I'm begging you, please balance the representation of your news Balance the representation of your broadcast, balance the representation on your television, balance the representation on a newspaper, balance the representation in every way, shape, or form. And you can speak up, right? You can speak up. You can speak up. It doesn't matter. You could be a, a, a photographer or whatever you are in the media. Everybody has the power as long as you're, you can speak. Even Helen Keller, who couldn't speak, couldn't see, couldn't hear, we still quote Helen Keller today. Let us quote you, my friend. Let us quote you. Thank you, Farid, for this opportunity. Um, Chrissy, I guess uh, we have come to the end of our uh, media conference. I'd like to thank all the media who have uh, tuned in. I'd also particularly like to thank all of the speakers, uh, Alex, uh, David, Noor, for participating. It's unfortunate that our other two speakers could not join us. But I think that we have um, outlined um, quite a number of possible solutions and calls to action. We are hoping that governments listen. We are hoping that the media um, helps to spread the message. And uh, we will continue our own efforts, not only in our individual lives, but through our own organizations to um, address the issues of uh, racism and hate, uh, bigotry, xenophobia in this country. 
and let's all work together to build the sort of um, diverse, inclusive, and accepting Canada that we all wish for. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you so much for hosting this.